All right, so my talk is called Now You're Thinking with Signals, a Reactive Cocoa Adventure. Um, so, yep, this is the, the title of the talk. And, but who is this guy? This guy is James Bone. Um, that is spelt correctly. That's not a typo. Uh, it's a little inconvenient at times, but it means I get my name as my uh, handle on all the things, which is great. And I'm an iOS software engineer at Outware Mobile, which is making some pretty cool apps, which is great fun. <laughs> Alright, so this talk is about functional reactive programming. Um, the last six months or so, I've been using this programming paradigm um, at, just on a project at work, and it's been pretty awesome. Uh, I'm going to warn you now that this talk is not going to be hugely technical. We're not going to go into a lot of code because I find, especially when you're starting off, this stuff can be quite uh, hard to follow. Um, and it just takes a bit of time to get used to the, how it all works. Um, so I'm going to talk about what functional reactive programming is, uh, why we want to use it, and also how to use it. So I'm going to be doing some examples using Reactive Cocoa 3, which is in Swift. Um, has anyone here done reactive programming before, functional reactive programming? Anyone done it in Swift? All right, cool. So is, with Reactive Cocoa, right? Cool, all right. So Reactive Cocoa in Swift is a little bit different to Objective-C. They've kind of... Uh, rethought the API a little bit and changed some stuff up, so that'll be, even you guys will learn some stuff today. So what is functional reactive programming? So it's, um, I think it's been around a while, and it starts off with F for functional. So functional programming is this thing that uh, everyone's been talking about, and it's like really kind of um, the in thing to, to say that you do functional programming. I don't know how many people actually do. Um, for production stuff, but anyway, I started looking into it, and I hadn't been exposed before, and it was terrifying. There was all these words like lambda calculus and endofunctors and monads and all this stuff, and I had no idea what was going on. Um, but you don't need to know any of that to use FRP. All you need to know is that functional programs have functions, obviously. Functions are like the major building block of these programs, and they're immutable, so you don't modify state, you just um, create new state if you need to. And they're stateless in the way that if they don't know anything about the past. So if you have a function that takes an input and you produce an output, it's always going to be the same um, for a given input, the same output. And this is great because it means that you can reason better about your programs. You can say, I know that this function with this input will always give me this output. And this makes testing great as well because you don't have things like, uh, like a global state that could change underneath you midway through running an execution. Um, which could change the output, and then you end up with, with errors to do with that. Things like race conditions um, can very often occur in this, this kind of thing. R is for reactive, and reactive programming makes Batman happy. So reactive programming is specifying uh, what you want the program to do instead of exactly the steps of how to do it. So there's this quote here, which I can't even read on you. Okay. Instead of telling a computer how to do its job, why don't we just tell it what its job is and let it figure the rest out? Um, this is from the Reactive Cocoa philosophy page, and I think it's a really core idea of functional reactive programming in that think of reactive programming in particular like a spreadsheet. So you've got some cells that uh, have some rules to say what the value should be, and you don't say um, every time a cell updates, you update some stuff. It just automatically updates. Um, and that's because someone else has done the work to make that updating happen for you. And so reactive programming essentially means that your reactive programming framework, like Reactive Cocoa, does the work of that for you. You don't need to write the steps of updating um, your state. And what this means is you're specifying the behavior of your code up front. You're getting derived state instead of um, explicitly defining all of the different state interactions. And this means that your logic is contained in one area. You don't have to scatter spaghetti-like all of your code into uh, delegate callbacks and callback blocks and properties to save some stuff for later on and pass it on, which is really great. So functional reactive programming is combining these two things. So obviously, we can't really do pure functional programming in iOS. It's just not going to work. So functional reactive programming tries to take the best bits of both of these and pull them together. Um, the way it does this is it uses streams of, of values and transformations on these and combinations of streams to derive the state of your application, either your UI um, and deriving that from some events in your app. But 
why do we want to do this? Like, why is this a good idea? So this is a quote um, from a blog post by Josh Abernathy, which says, UIs are big, messy, mutable, stateful bags of sadness, which is uh, very true. UIs are the worst. But I would just extend this to say apps in general are big, messy, mutable, stateful bags of sadness. We need state because otherwise we can't show screens, we can't show differences between, like, you know, the, there has to be some sort of state to show the user, and there's nothing we can do about that. But FRP helps us reduce the amount of state we have to keep track of. It results in simpler programs with less code, and it also results in cleaner, more readable code. Um, so at the moment, we write apps by having a UI and an app, and then some stuff happens, and we just kind of poke it until it works, and just hope that it all is going to work fine. But with things like asynchronous networking, callbacks, um, watch kit connectivity, beacons, all this stuff, it can be kind of hard to know what's going to happen when you poke it. So FRP helps us to explicitly define um, how that's going to work. So, Reactive Coco. Reactive Coco has been around a while. Um, it's the functional reactive programming framework we use on iOS and Mac. And it's open source. It's got a really active community, lots of um, people contributing. And just recently, they released Reactive Coco 3, which is, oh well, it's in the re release candidate for Reactive Coco 3, which is mostly um, a new Swift framework. So Reactive Coco 3 doesn't change the Objective-C framework much, but um, the new Swift framework is like the new focus of Reactive Coco. They're going to be putting most of the development time into the Swift framework now. Uh, it was originally inspired by Rx, or Reactive Extensions, from C Sharp that Microsoft made. But it's diverged a fair bit from that, especially with the new Swift API. They've kind of gone in a new direction to hopefully make it better um, and more suitable for uh, app programming. <laughs> And so, yeah, if you've done the Objective-C API before, this is going to be a little different, but just roll with it. Uh, similar concepts, but some of the code is just going to be a little, little different. All right, so signals, the title of the talk. Signals are the basic building block of Reactive Coco programs. Um, a signal is modeling a stream of values over time. So it'll be something like a network request, or say you've got a... a yeah, a network request that, that you do some stuff, and then it, it gives you a value, which might be your record response, uh, and then it, it finishes. And that might seem really, really simple, but it's incredibly powerful because you can model almost anything with this. Pretty much any, anything in your app you can think of, you can model with signals. And this gives us the advantage that if everything's modeled with the same interface, we can then combine them all together to um, really elegantly express what our logic should be. So what's an event? So they send events over time, but this is the actual code. I think that's the actual code. Cool. That's the actual code of the event uh, enum in Reddit Coco 3. And these are the four things that an event can be. It can be a next event, which is just a value provided by a signal. Um, an error event, which is that something went wrong. We've had an error. Um, no further events will be received. It's the end. Completed means we successfully finished. We've sent all our, our next values, and we're done. And interrupted means that it's been cancelled. So something interrupted the execution, and we're not going to get any more values, but um, it wasn't a successful completion. Now, this is a, in Swift, this is like, these are typed things. So it, this is a generic type, obviously, but you know that your event will always be of a certain type. So you might have a, a signal that sends integers. So the events will be of um, type with an integer and some sort of error. But you know that it'll always be an integer. You can't get random stuff. And in, in Reactive Coco in Objective C, um, you used to just get random objects. I mean, it, it wasn't there was no type safety at all, which meant that you could often get errors where you'd have a signal that sent you were expecting to send a view controller, and actually sent uh, an NS error, and then you get very confused. So this is a little diagram of a signal. So it's pretty simple. It sends integers. Starts off by going along. This is time. That axis. Um, Time is very important in Reactive Coco. It's in imperative program. We sort of just assume time is there, and we don't, don't really deal with it. Um, we just hope for the best. Whereas in Reactive Coco, we try and uh, treat time as a first-class citizen in our program. So we say we're going to actually deal with time as an actual concept. So this one sends just a number one. Then after some time has passed, it sends a number two. After more some time, it sends a number three, and then we complete and we're done, um, which is great. Now this signal sends integers, but you can imagine that this could be uh, 
location updates, this could be view controllers, this could be anything in your program. So, signals in reactive GoGo3. So this is a little different to signals in Objective-C. Um, you have a signal type which is generic, so you can obviously it's typed, and also there's an error type which is great because Originally, you can only have NS errors in Objective-C, but you can create your own error types in, in Swift, which is great. It also means that there's a type which is no error, which is, I think, an enum with no cases, which means you can't actually make that, that value. Um, it, will try and, it will just throw an error if you try and throw an error on this signal. Like the, it won't compile, sorry, if you try and throw an error on this signal, which is great, because it means you can be sure that before runtime, you, you know that your, um, your signal will never send an error. Um, and so signals, this type, um, actual signal type, is used to model existing streams of things. So things that are happening in your app, whether anyone's watching or not. Things like user input, notifications, uh, location updates, um, beacon region monitoring, anything like that. So what happens with this is the events will start happening. And if you want to subscribe and or observe these events, you can explicitly say, hey, I want to I get all the events from now um, until I stop, stop observing. So these are things that are going to happen regardless. Now, oh, and this is a, a push-driven event stream. So you don't ask the signal for some values. The signal tells you that there's a new value, and you handle it in some way. Now, signal producers are the new thing. So this is, uh, so the last signals we looked at were what we call hot signals, which means that they're always active and we, they don't need an observer. But signal producers model what we call cold signals, which is where you do some work, you create a signal, and then it delivers you the results on a, on a signal, on a, on a stream. So in this case, with a network request, um, the work might be to create the request, uh, get the URL, actually send it off to the internet, and the internet goes, hey, okay, I've got your result, here you go, and it gives you your response or an error. Um, and then the signal will complete. Something like a modal view is another um, <coughs> case for a signal producer. So in this case, you might create a view controller and present it as the work to be done. And then the signal itself, if your modal, say, had a form on it, could send you the results of what the user typed into the form. And lastly, another thing is the watch connectivity. So uh, I was having a chat with Adam about uh, the watch apps um, talk by... Uh, I can't remember who did the watch app talk yesterday, but we were saying that Reactive Coco would be an awesome way to model watch connectivity because you know, you're often doing asynchronous calls to the phone, it's giving you back some results, and even just the life cycle of the watch. I mean, things like all the different become actives and will show and all that kind of thing um, would be a really easy way to model that with, with signals. Now, errors. Errors are treated like they're actually important in Reactive Coco, which is great. So every time there's an error, this is called railway-oriented programming, this diagram. Um, the idea is that you've got these functions. Um, this could be signals, this could be anything. But railway-oriented programming means that if there's an error, it'll diverge off the main path and just shortcut straight to the end and say, hey, there was an error, don't bother doing all that other stuff. Um, and this is really great because I think everyone's been in this situation where you have a heap of asynchronous callbacks and block callbacks and things, and you end up with callback hell and like 700 indented lines of horrible code. So this lets you just say, do all this stuff, and then handle the errors in one spot, rather than having to do lots of error checking in between your code. All right, so I'm going to go to the internet now and show you some operators. <coughs> Hopefully this actually works. Can I make this full screen? Control. Yeah, cool. All right. So this is a little site called Rack Marbles, which is really cool. And these things are marbles, and you can kind of move them around. And this is a stream of events. So it'll give you like the result of performing an operator on a signal. So in this case, we're using the map <coughs> operator. And what a map operator does is you take a value, you do something to it, some transformation, and then you get a new stream with the transformed values. In this case, we're saying for every value we get, multiply it by 10. So we start with 1, 2, 3, we end up with 10, 20, 30, which is pretty sweet. We can do this doesn't have to be the same type. I mean, you can transform from integers to strings, or integers to view controllers, or view controllers to beacon regions, whatever you want. Uh, we can also delay things. So time being explicit in Reactive Cocoa is really great. It means you can do things like 
hey, I want to I delay this, this stream or this, this thing from happening by X number of seconds, which is really cool. <laughs> so they're the transforming operators. Um, there's lots of other operators I haven't actually done yet in Rec Marvels, but these are the, the, the simple ones, so we'll just go with these. You can filter, so you can say, hey, filter the values that are only the ones that are greater than 10. So it just throws away, you won't receive any of the values that don't match this condition. So that's super useful. Um, and you can kind of mix these together. So you could say, you know, give me all the ones that are less than 10 and then multiply them by something, or then transform them into another value. And then, so, so that's our uh, filtering. And then we can combine stuff. So combine latest will give us uh, two, st two streams, and every time both of them send a value, or after the first time both of them send a value, it'll give you both the values. So you can say, I've got two disparate streams of events, and I want to have both of them together. Um, so this could be good if you have two network calls um, happening at once, and you say, hey, I want to do something with the result of both of these, but not until both of them are finished. So this is a really great way of combining those together. Um, and then they call these flattening operators, but they're sort of a similar kind of thing where you're combining two streams. So concat, it says, hey, do this stream first, and then send me the events from the other stream. So that's pretty simple. And merge is also pretty simple. It just says, hey, give me both of the things, any of the things that happened on any of the streams. So that is some operators. Um, that's quite a lot of, oh, how do I get out of that? Yeah, cool. So that's a lot to probably take in if you haven't done any of this kind of stuff before. And without code examples, it's kind of hard to see how you would use it. But um, just keep it in mind that there is a lot of operators. There's, I mean, to, the to-do page on this has got all of these, and I think that's not even close to the, the full number of operators in Reactive Coco. Um, but yeah, that's, operators are, pro the, the majority of your work is going to be working with operators and different streams and, and transforming them in different ways. All right. So, that's one example. So I'm going to go through a canonical example of Reactive Cocoa that is on, you can find on the Reactive Cocoa uh, GitHub page um, on their README. It just has like, a, it has the code for this and uh, a bit of notes, but hopefully, I, I was going to try and do some more examples in this talk, but uh, I didn't really have enough time and Xcode 7 beta wasn't working with me last night when I was trying to do live coding, so I thought it was best not to, not to tempt the fates. Um, so, we're just going to go through this simple example, and it'll give you a feel for it, and you can always uh, look for more examples um, online. There's a, there's a great documentation on Reactive Cocoa, so uh, not a huge amount of tutorials on Swift yet, but hopefully that'll come. All right, so the point of this example is, imagine we have a view controller with a text field, and every time the text field changes, we want to do something with the text. So every time it changes, we'll say, hey, get the text. We're going to do a network request to our server that says, hey, uh, do a search on this text and give me a result. We'll pretend it's like a Google, Google result. Um, then we're going to convert that to, we're get, that's going to come back in some JSON. We're going to convert that to a, an actual JSON object, so parse the string. And then we will change that to a model object, and then we'll use that to update our UI. So this code here is saying, uh, let search strings, which is just a signal. Um, and you don't have to explicitly type stuff because it can be inferred from the, when you create it. Uh, but, so this will be a signal called search strings, or a signal producer, sorry. Um, we're using the text field rack text signal, so RegCoco provides you with a heap of really helpful extensions to UIKit and a host of other of the frameworks that you use, which is really great because it means you don't have to write all this stuff. Um, I mean, you could, but it's a lot of work already being done for you, which is great. But that function is only in Objective-C currently. So we have to use this little bit of magic incantation to convert it to a Swift signal producer instead of an Objective-C signal. But that's not really important. And then the last thing we do is we use map, which is that first function we sort of transform things. So it's taking a value, which in this state is an NS string. And we're saying, hey, I don't want an NS string. I want this to be a Swift string. So we're going to go cast that. And so now we have... Every time the text changes in this text field, we will get a string value on our signal, which is great. <coughs> so there's a bit more code. Don't worry too much, but we'll, we'll get there. So first things first, we need to do our network, our network call. So we use flat map, and what flat map is, is it's sort of like map, except that instead of going from a value to another value, you're going from a value to another signal. And what that means is that it lets you chain signals together. So in this case, we're saying, 
our signal, which is our strings for our search, we're going to chain that to a network request. And that means that the network request could, could fail and you get all this nice error handling stuff, the railway, the railway track style programming, which I was talking about before. Um, and yeah, so we use flatmap for, for chaining another signal. So we take our, our query string, uh, we create a request, and we use this rack data with the request, which is another helper function, which creates a signal from a NSURL session to do a request, which is really handy. Um, so now we have a signal that every time we type in the text field, we'll make a network request based on that query. But we need to do some more stuff. So now let's do uh, the JSON parsing. So we've got a, we've got a, a map here, which takes in... Uh, so our network request signal will send us some data and a URL response. So what we want to do here is map that data, we'll convert that data to a string first, and then parse some JSON out of that. So... Yep, so we just map, and this will take the two values we got and just do some work. Uh, simple converting to, to JSON, which is great. So now we have a signal that every time we type in the text box will give us some JSON, which is great. But we also wanted to parse to our model object as well, so we can use another map to say, with the JSON results, now parse ourselves a model, and now we have a signal which, every time we type in the search box, will give us a model. So, I mean, that's a fair bit of work for not very much code, which is great. And it's pretty easy to follow. We just say, hey, do that, then do this, then do that. And the last thing we do is we observe on the UI scheduler, which is just saying, deliver the results of this thread on, oh, sorry, the results of this signal on the main thread. And the reason we're doing that is because uh, when we use this, we want to be able to update the UI. Um, so we don't want any weird asynchronous stuff happening there. So I've got a signal. It almost does all the stuff we want, but... It hasn't done anything yet. Um, signals are lazy in that when you create them, nothing actually happens. It's just a description of the rules of how to do the work, um, which is great, but it also means we have to start it. So it's pretty easy. We just say, it's the name of our signal search results. We say start, call the start function, and we pass it in a closure to perform when we get a next event. Um, you can also pass in a closure for completed, error, all the other kind of states you could get. Uh, but in this case, we don't care about those. We're just going to say, every time we get a new model, update the UI with that model. Easy. All right, now for some magic. So that was cool, and that was pretty straightforward. And there's not that much code, which is really nice. But let's say that we had a really dodgy API that failed 30% of the time. But we didn't want our users to just get nothing. Um, we don't want it to fail every time. Um, and also, you will notice that we're not handling errors anywhere in this um, signal. So if one of those data requests were to fail, the entire signal would error and we wouldn't be able to use it anymore. Because of that railway-oriented programming, um, the error would pass all the way through to the end and the, the signal would just finish, which means you wouldn't get any more results, which is kind of sad. So we have to handle errors and... I think we can do one better than that as well, but you'll see. So this is very similar to the last bit of code you saw. It's pretty much exactly the same, but with two extra functions. The first one is the catch function. So because this started with the request is a signal, it means we can apply signal operators on it the same way we, do it, we would any other signal. Um, so we can catch the error, and what catch does is it says, hey, don't pass that error on to the rest of the train track. Just do something with it, and then I'll provide you with what to do. So in this case, we say, hey, display the error on the screen. Maybe we've got a pop-up or something. I don't know. Um, and then we pass in signal producer.empty, which is just saying, instead of raising the error to, this is, this, is, this is what gets sent to the next level of the chain. So in this case, we say, hey, actually just return nothing. Don't do anything. Just ignore the errors completely, which is, in this case, I think it's fine. It's, we're, we're handling the errors, and then we're, we're ignoring them. This is a really good example of, oh, sorry, the other thing is retry. So you can imagine how much work it would be to try and make retry in traditional programming. You'd have to have some sort of counter to see how many times you've retried. You'd have to catch each of the errors. You'd have to probably do some sort of weird recursive call into your function to do the thing again. It would be an absolute nightmare. So what React to Coco lets you do is just say retry three times. This handles all of the work for you of doing the retry. Um, this is a great example of, of 
the quote from earlier, which is telling the program what to do instead of how. In this case, someone else has already done the work of, of handling retry. So we just say, hey, do that thing. You already know how to do it, so that's great for us. Um, we don't care how the retry works internally because I trust Reactive Coco to do it right. Maybe that's not the right thing to do, but every, I, mean, I think it's been tested by a lot of people and there's, there's a lot of contributors using it, so generally all the operators work as they say on the box. But there's a bit more we can do. Um, there's a few problems with our original program, which is that the text signal will make a network request every time we type, which is not great because if you spam type on the keyboard, you're going to flood your network, you know, flood your server with like 60 requests that you're not even going to use most of, um, which is kind of a waste. So there's a couple of more operators that we can use to, to do this. So there's multiple operators to incorporate time into your streams, as we said before, so delaying things. But you can also throttle, sorry, throttle up, um, your signals as well. So in this case, we've got our original search strings. So this is our uh, text signal from the text field. And so we've got a signal here that sends strings, but we might want to say, don't, don't do this unless a bit of time has passed. So in this case, we say throttle for half a second, which means that we only let new values through if half a second has passed, at least. And this means that, um, yeah, it's, it's a pretty easy way of just saying, hey, don't send them all through at once, just have like a gating. So we have a gate that opens after half a second has passed. Um, and hey, that's one line of code for something that would probably be very difficult otherwise. You'd have to have an NS timer, you'd have to have uh, some state to hold all that stuff and all this crazy stuff, which is all encapsulated in this one function, which is super useful and, and really easy to use. And filter as well. So we might say, hey, don't bother doing searches with three or four characters. That would just be um, maybe pointless. We don't really need those. Uh, not many words are that short. So yeah, we just say filter all the text in this. Um, if it's greater than four, then we let it through. Otherwise, just ignore it completely, which is uh, pretty nice. And the other good thing about this is you can just read down the, down the, the lines of code and kind of just see what it's doing. You can say, hey, we've got a signal producer. We, we map it to a string. Then we filter it with this condition. And then we throttle it by this much. And to do this without Reactive Cocoa would probably require code that is not particularly easy to read, or at least it's harder to make it easy to read. Um, you would have things stored around in different places. You'd probably have multiple points of entry, like lots of different places to store all this stuff. And um, what Reactive Coco lets you do is just encapsulate that into this nice little block, which is awesome. So what has Reactive Coco given us? So we've got less code, definitely all that, um, those helpful functions. But I think the biggest thing is maintainability and readability. So I think the biggest thing that I've found from my workplace is that we've been on this project for a really long time. It's been six months, and it's a lot of code, and it's pretty complicated, very complex app. Um, but because we've used Reactive Coco, it's found that if we have last minute changes or, or things that have to be fixed, it's really not difficult. Um, for example, we had a similar issue to this where, um, related to the last talk, we had, we had some beacons and we were entering beacon ranges and saying, hey, I'm near this beacon. But beacons are not particularly reliable and often they would just drop out and not work 100% of the time. So we wanted to add in a, uh, a delay. So if the value that we got back was saying, no, you're not in the beacon anymore, we wanted to say, hey, wait, 30 seconds, and then, and then recheck re again, and just make sure that it's not, um, you know, not, not a false negative. And it was one operator. Like, that, that really complex requirement just took essentially a throttle with a, with a simple check. Um, and what could have taken days or even, like, a week to do in traditional programming, uh, yeah, only took half an hour. And the other thing is readability. So... I think just the fact that you can put your you can, you can transform your streams as a sequence of steps is the biggest uh, helpfulness or readability that you get out of Reactive Coco. I mean, 
it's just so much easier to see what's happening when you don't have to jump around different files, jump around different parts of the file, and you can just say, this is how it's going to work. And usually it works really well. Um, there's a couple of problems with Directed GoGo. The first being that it's pretty hard to learn when you start. Um, I think that's just because no one's really familiar with this style of programming. Everyone's grown up with OOP and MVC and all these kind of things. But, and you do that at uni, and then, then you might have a look at reactive programming and think, what the hell is this? This is super confusing. Um, what's, a, what's a monad? I don't know. But I think the biggest thing that you can do is just try it, stick with it for a while, and after a while it just becomes, um, becomes something that is actually helping even your not FRP style code. So you might think, hey, this, this is really nice. We don't have that many properties. Like our state's really nicely explicitly declared. It's not um, scattered around. And just being able to think in that way is really helpful for programming as a whole, not just reactive programming. So where to next? So they've got a website, reactivecoco.io, which has uh, a really cool philosophy page, which I saw that quote from before, which kind of just looks, uh, looks at kind of why it's a good idea, it's kind of the stuff that I was going on about at the start of the talk. Um, and you can also just go to Reactive Cocoa on GitHub. They've got a really active GitHub page, lots of issues, um, really great community. And you can pretty much find docs about pretty much the entire framework on, that, on their GitHub page. And also the source code is really, really, really well documented. Probably the one of the best documented source codes I've, I've seen on an open source project. And I mean, you can go to the... Um, you don't know what a certain operator does, you can just go to its, its uh, Swift file and it'll just give you the exact um, description of what it does and how to use it. And yeah, try it out. I mean, it's, it's something that you can easily just integrate into your app in little bits. You could just start out by using it on um, just for a little bit of networking that you want to try it out or something like that. Um, but it really does get better the more you use it. It's one of those things where if you go all in, you're going to get the most benefit out of it. Um, and we've done that on, on the project I've been working on. We found that sometimes it doesn't always work 100%, but you can do at least as well as you could without it. And you also get all these great benefits of being able to compose things together and uh, have all the, the benefits of more readable code, more maintainable code. So I've only scratched the surface in this talk of uh, what you can do with reactive programming. There's obviously a lot more. Um, but you should really um, definitely check out the Radicoco GitHub page. Definitely check out any tutorials out there. Even the Objective-C tutorials are great if you're stuck with Swift. And um, yeah, it's a great framework and I'll be hopefully using it for a long time to come. Thank you very much. <laughs> any questions? Nick. If you have a large code base that does not use any reactive cocoa, mm -hmm. but wish to start writing reactive cocoa, what it tells to to keep things consistent, but also start to migrate things towards Horizon? Yeah, so um, you can sort of just, if you, if you wanted, I mean, you can use signals just as a alternative to callback-based, sort of block-based programming as well. So if you have something like a network request that has a block or two blocks or multiple callbacks that you can use, you can just replace that one call with a signal um, and just use the subscribing to the next event and the completed event and the error event instead of your callbacks. And that is a really nice way of just easing your way in because it's really similar to what you've already done before, but it also lets you, if you want, ex extend that to more interesting stuff later on. I would use the Swift version if I had to start from somewhere, from scratch. Um, there's a lot of great things in the Swift version which you don't get in Reactive Cocoa, particularly the typing, um, which is really, really nice. And also there's the separation between signals and signal producers, which in Objective-C is, is really, it's kind of um, vague. You, kind of ha you know you've got a signal, but unless you document it really well, whether it's going to have some side effects or not, um, or if it's a hot signal that just is happening, it's really hard to know which is which and whether subscribing to that signal is going to mess with your stuff or create a new signal or do a network request you didn't even think of. So Swift really makes that more explicit and it's, it's just a better language. 
I'll make a call. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Have you had any experience with RX Swift? I have not. I do. I, ha I have read the their, their sort of spiel, and it seems that they're really sticking with the uh, original RX C sharp style of things, um, which is cool. But I think that Reactive Cocoa, the way they've diverged off that original RX spec is that it's more of um, the, the w when they have diverged, it's been to make it easier or better in some way, or, or more suitable for Cocoa and iOS. So, I mean, sure, it's probably got a lot of the same elements, and <laughs> obviously a lot of these concepts would transfer over to any RX framework. But, um, yeah, Reactive Cocoa, I've found at least, is just a nicer framework for working with apps in particular, and iOS and UIs and things like that. Um, but, yeah, it's, it, it's probably very similar. Um, but, yeah, you can kind of try either. <laughs> Alrighty. Cool, thanks, guys.